Between the Lines would like to thank Protection Strategies Incorporated for sponsoring tonight's program. One of our country's leading providers of integrated security services, including operational security, training, testing, and evaluation. Clients of PSI include the Department of Justice, the FBI, and the Department of Energy. Brian Spitzer, for Circuit Court Judge, is also sponsoring tonight's program. Brian is a prosecutor and Army medic for six years and a lifetime Tennessean. A graduate of Vanderbilt Law School, Brian is dedicated to serving the citizens of Anderson County. Good evening. We're back on Between the Lines for our third episode, and I hope everybody had a great July 4th weekend. And we're going to talk tonight, and thank you again, let me say, for viewing the last two weeks for with Congressman Fleischman. But now they've got a real expert. And uh, <laughs> Sean P. Williams is the president, CEO, and majority owner of Protection Strategy, one of our main sponsors. But he's an expert on cyber threats civilization, foreign countries, just you know, you'll hear tonight about the things that threaten the United States and, and what the conditions of the world are right now. So we're really looking forward to this show. So please pay close attention and because and, what, what you learn may save your life. It's great stuff. All right. Sean is a, was a, what, what was your rank, Sean? Was you just a, you were a I was just a, I was Air Force. fire enlisted. Air Force. He had over 290 around 290 jumps, more than 250 jumps. Uh, he was in the air, what we call, was in the Air Force as a PJ for 11 years, paratrooper in nine months. So we appreciate your service. That's a lot of service. Pararescue, man. Yes, Pararescue. Sir. That's a lot of service jumping out of airplanes that many times. I mean, You're too kind. And there's, no, and, and you know, we need to appreciate our military more, and I think we're starting to. I mean, we had, you know, I grew up in the 70s where it was looked down on almost. I mean, we appreciated the World War II people, but Vietnam was rough, and then we had Iraq. But I think the country's starting to come around, at least parts of the country. Well, certainly Tennessee. I mean, I've lived all over the country and the world, and, and uh, Tennessee honors their vets, and they take good care of us. So it's, it's the best state in the Union. Yeah, it is the best state in the Union. And, and I think the more studies we see on education and civics, you saw an article come out a couple weeks ago about we rank in the top five in the country, our children's aware of civic issues, yeah. so I feel good. We're at the top of all the right lists. Right. <laughs> I think all of us know that there is a power structure that runs this world that's, by, that's bigger than countries and has different things that work, and it has throughout time, And mo but in the modern era, it's even more so. And Sean's going to tell us a little bit about that and what threatens that, <laughs> and we're going to talk a little bit about how civilization survives from generation to generation and are we under threats right now of our civilization collapsing and i'll let sean talk about that a little bit no i appreciate it, alan you're you're too generous and too kind uh, it all sounds better coming from you than yeah. it probably actually was but yeah I, you know homeland security and defense of this country has been my life's work and you know going in the military right out of high school and then coming out in 99 i've been engaged in in security work for the federal government for the last 22 years and almost 12 years prior to that. So it, it really is uh, what I've devoted my life study to. And, and we live in a time, uh, historically an unprecedented time. And, and no matter who you talk to, when you turn the TV on, when you listen to people, everybody feels like something's changed. Everybody feels like the world is not as good as it once was, that we were facing things uh, that, that our grandparents didn't have to deal with or, or, or dealt with in a different way. And so I, I want to talk a little bit about kind of the history of civilization. And, and there's a guy named Dr. Ian Morris, and he is a uh, archaeologist from Oxford. He's written a couple of great books. He's led leading research on why civilization civilizations decline and fail. And he's taken hundreds of years of archaeological digs, billions of artifacts, you know, all these things are now collected and fed into uh, mass data analysis, and they're, they're able to do studies today that they've never been able to do. And, and what he's discovered throughout history, number one, no, no nation survives. 
in all of history. No empire survives. No country survives. If you look at all of written history, all civilizations eventually fail. And that's whether that's the Ottomans, the Turks, the Prussians, the Greeks, the Romans. Uh, none of them are here today. And so all historical evidence says 500 years from now, none of the countries that are here today will most likely be here. And so what Dr. Morris has spent his life's work doing is trying to understand why that is. And so he, he's identified five major historical factors that impact almost every major decline or failure of civilization. And if we could get slide two up real quick. I'll slide two, Brent. Our man, Brett. Brad's in the back. Here it is. Yeah. So looking at all those years of historical data, uh, there's a handful of things that, that you find in every instance of major decline or failure of population. One is uncontrolled population movement or mass migration, uh, new epidemic diseases, geopolitical instability, which is state failures, and sometimes it's uh, mass migration and diseases cause state failure, these things cascade. And then economic decline, uh, which leads to the collapse of trade routes and those types of things, and climate change, surprisingly enough. Huh. And, and, and so what's interesting, that's, that's interesting. good, Brett. What's interesting is, you can take the slide, there we yeah, go. There you go. Uh, what's interesting about that is we live in a, in a time period where all five of those major forces are in play on an epic global scale today. Let me ask you a question. Yeah, go ahead. Jump in. It's, when I look at history as a whole, and, and Chuck and I talked about this, Congressman and I did, about yeah. history. He loves Roman history. I've read all history and political. It seems like things are accelerating now quicker. Like if you look at Greece and Rome, they didn't have the acceleration of they technology. Didn't. So to me, the biggest thing I'm scared of is we can't control technology. And that would be global insecurity, I guess, or uh, what, yeah, what was the word? It, geopolitical. Geopolitical, and and I, and and we'll and I'm going to full. We'll go through all of those okay. and kind of fully develop sure. them as we go. But I, I can say that when you compare what happened to the Western Empire under Rome and its collapse, it was much slower. The scale was much smaller when you look at the populations involved, and and the technology was much simpler. So on every level, the scale and the scope of complexity of what we're facing today is greater than at any other point in history, just by the sheer, uh, you know, seven billion people on the planet. You know, that's just the scale of the thing that we're dealing with. But if you look at what's happening, you look at pre-COVID, you look at mass migration from failed states in the Middle East, mm -hmm. mass migration going into places that have never really seen it, like Switzerland and Sweden and in Europe when Merkel kind of opened the floodgates for all so the migrants. Mass, mass migration means entire populations moving to other countries? Thousands of people. Tens yeah. of thousands, yeah. 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 Okay. And, and if you look at what's happening on our border, if you put up slide three, and you just leave it up for just a second. Um, by every measure, um, global migration is is higher in 2020 than in than in most other periods throughout throughout history. From 150 to 272 million people report the number of international immigrants doubled. Wow. In 2020. So everybody's moving around. So there's millions of people on the move, and some of those are uh, legitimate moves, and they're they're being done through uh, uh, healthy, uh, productive means of migration, legal means of migration. But millions of those are not being done legally, and, and that causes immense pressure. Uh, it, it leaves a big void in the countries they leave, and it puts immense pressure on the countries that they go into financially and otherwise. What's the bottom graph? Male and female? I, I couldn't read the red and the and what are the what is the graph? Tell yeah, that's that. the that's the division of of uh, gender. And how does that affect us? Is that, how, why is that important? Uh, just another way that they split it up. I don't okay. know that just it makes sense. I don't know that it's just statistic. Okay. It, looks pretty, it looks pretty balanced, actually. But, but I can tell you that when you look back at mass migration events in past history to compare to what we're seeing, we have a very fluid, very highly mobile uh, global population now that creates immense pressure politically and financially on those countries. And, and this isn't a political statement about migration because all of the history of America, you know, I'm a third generation, sure, uh, me too. you know, immigrant uh, success story. Me too. But when you look at the pressure it creates and financially and economically and other, every other way, it is a destabilizing activity on the countries, both that people are leaving because it devastates talent and it devastates, uh, you know, you go to Syria, try to find a doctor, they've all left and gone to countries where they can have stability. And then it puts pressure on the countries that they're going to. So when we talk about civilizations, we're a melting pot in the United States. We are. Would you call the United States government and the United States a civilization? 
Or would it yeah, be I would say we're an empire. We're one of the greatest empires in the history of the world. Nothing, nothing like America has ever happened, even on a relative scale, not even Rome. You know, when you look at the sheer wealth we've generated in the short amount of time, if you think about American rise to eminence, it's been in the last 76 years. Oh, yeah. No, no empire has risen this far, this fast on scope, scale, sure. wealth, military might in a 100-year period. And, and really technology driven again. I mean, weapons, and electricity, cars. All of the above, yeah. and which creates a lot of our kind of fragile infrastructure, too, which we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. But So the other forces that are at work, and I'll move through them, uh, he talked about epidemics. If you can put the next slide up, there's no, no, no ifs, ands, or buts about the fact that we just survived the, the most historic global epidemic in our lifetime with COVID-19, just on sheer scale and proliferation of the virus globally, as well as the, the deaths caused by it. And, and the most uh, probably impactful thing was the sheer economic devastation caused by the way governments reacted to... That's true. To That's right. Would to, we have been better off using a herd mentality in that, not for medical sake, but well, for the sake of civilization and economics? Do you think we... It's hard to say we put too many protections in place. That's, of course, yeah. we needed protections, but should we have closed businesses? Such a, such a politically charged oh, question. Oh, yeah, but, uh, forget it. So <laughs> I, I, would, I would say that we won't know. I mean, if you look at the way these things play out in, in time, space, and history, we probably won't know for another 25 years if we did the right thing or not. If you, if you, if you look at what the World Food Organization is saying, we're going to kill more people. The economic shutdown will kill millions and millions of more people through starvation worldwide Worldwide than the disease, the disease itself ever would have killed. That's right. So the question then becomes, what's the trade-off? Sure. So you have uh, sheer economic damage uh, to save lives. Sure. But then now we have, we're on track for, I think, about 86 million people to starve to death yeah. as a reaction to the economic shutdown. And what shutdown. was the starvation before that? That's an addition to eighty-six the, additional million. Eighty-six million additional to the normal million. line of yeah. starvation. Line. And this is coming out of the UN, the World Food Organization. These aren't these aren't my numbers. And so, yeah. um, but you know, I'm not a political leader. I'm not in the position to have to make those decisions. And and so, are we going to think globally and holistically, or are we going to think about what we do at home? Right. And so, I, I think time will tell. We'll know. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the other uh, five horsemen of the apocalypse, as Dr. Ian Morris called them, is geopolitical instability. And I would say that on a, on a global scale, we're dealing with real geopolitical instability today. Yeah, let's too. talk about a little bit more what I know about, a little bit more about historically. I mean, the European, I mean, when I was a young man studying 40 years ago in college, it seems like. Italy was a little bit unstable. Some other countries were. They had 20 political parties. We had some. Obviously, World War II was a major sure. instability. I just don't feel as unstable. I guess I'm insulated, but I don't feel as unstable as as unstable world. We don't feel that the world is unstable like I did when I was young. So well, this, this is a this is a threat index for the geopolitical uh, index, and and there's a bunch of failing state indexes out there. Okay. But they all look like this. So green is what you want when you look at this map. So okay. if, if you look at the economic indicators, the geopolitical uh, indicators of politics and social unrest. There's far more yellow, red, and orange on the What does map. yellow mean? Uh, it's caution. It's in early stage. And in, the red is bad. Is bad. You know, that's failed state. You know, that's places like most of Africa, Venezuela. Blue? Um, what what's is, that? I'm sorry, jump. Blue? What is blue? Can blue is go good. The blue is best. Blue is best. The so Alaska is a pretty stable place, according right. to the map. <laughs> so it's like Canada is, too. Yeah, Canada, uh, Australia. And with all due, with all due <laughs> respect to my Canadian friends, I don't know if it's worth the sacrifice. Okay, we'll go on. I'm, my grandparents were from Montreal. We won't get into Quebec, that. so uh, if Quebec's stable, everything's but, safe. But if you look at a lot of these failing states, like you look at what's happening in right. Syria and, and, and parts of the Middle East uh, with Libya, that's part of what leads to mass migration, yeah. right? Yeah. And so when I talk about it cascading, when you when you have economic decline, like what we're watching in Lebanon right now, right? Uh, and you can take the slide down, Brent. Yeah, we're done. Uh, when, you, when you look at Lebanon, where you have sheer economic decline, that leads to civil unrest. 
right? And and people are hungry. They don't trust their governments anymore. And these things begin to cascade because that now leads to mass immigration out of those countries. Those countries rarely fully recover by losing all their talent and their best and brightest and their young people. And it puts uh, sometimes good pressure on the countries they go to and sometimes immense pressure. Uh, if you look at what's happening at our southern border right now, it's costing us billions of dollars uh, to deal with uh, unprecedented level of migrants. And this is a historic year for us yeah, and, with migration. And, and full discovery, Sean, you actually work at the border and have contracts at the border. You, you're I do. very familiar yeah. with what's going on down there. And um, Yeah, we are, our second largest customer is Health and Human Services, so we've been a part of the Unaccompanied Minors program since right. about 2007. But we process uh, the, the, we're part of the case processing of the Unaccompanied Minors. Right. We do the investigations to make sure they're not going into sex trafficked homes sure. or into uh, forced labor, but they're actually going into safe places. And so to give you an idea of the scale, um, typical year for us is 25, 30,000 kids. Right. This year we're on track to uh, process between 225,000 and 250,000. Ten times more. So when I say what's happening on our border right now is historic, it is. Okay. And it's not getting a lot of airtime, but yeah. the folks <laughs> behind the scenes are, are certainly um, dealing with it. And that will put immense pressure on this country. Some of that good, some of that not good economically. Uh, and it, you, 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 you we're going to take a break real okay. quick. I'm sorry. We'll take no, a two-minute break, and we'll be right back. Hello. I'm District Attorney General Dave Clark. My fellow DAs and I successfully fought for new elder abuse laws and procedures that have police departments and agencies using improved tools to protect our seniors. Victims of elder abuse are often unable to recognize or report abuse themselves. They need your voice. If you suspect abuse, contact local law enforcement or Adult Protective Services. Let's work together to protect our seniors. Always ready, always there. Visit NationalGuard.com to find out more. Since the moment you were born, I've made a thousand wishes. Wishes for your future in a world that's changing fast. Do play and laugh. Do win and lose. Do it all with confidence, kindness, and strength. And always do your best to remember that no matter what you do in this life, what matters to me, is that you keep doing. What if one day you went to your secret hiding place and instead of what you came for, you found this? What would you do? The truth is, all drug use comes with risk. Before drugs take their toll on you and your family, know that there is help. You can quit. If you or someone you love is struggling with drug use, call 1-800-662-HELP for 24-hour free and confidential information and treatment referral, or go to samhsa.gov slash know the risks. Between the Lines would like to thank Protection Strategies Incorporated for sponsoring tonight's program. One of our country's leading providers of integrated security services, including operational security, training, testing, and evaluation. Clients of PSI include the Department of Justice, the FBI, and the Department of Energy. Brian Spitzer, for Circuit Court Judge, is also sponsoring tonight's program. Brian is a prosecutor and Army medic for six years and a lifetime Tennessean. A graduate of Vanderbilt Law School, Brian is dedicated to serving the citizens of Anderson County. Welcome back to Between the Lines. We're talking with Sean P. Williams, the CEO of... PSI, and he's telling us, he's informing us, he's letting us know that there are some issues out there and we, we need to be aware of them. So one last question, what we're talking about, does the stability of these governments that, that protect civilization, is there any quantitative information that says capitalism, socialism, you know, different things are different? I mean, I saw Canada's doing well. They have kind of a pseudo-socialistic government. America's a capitalistic government, at least for now. And, uh, you know, so what's history say? Well, I mean, we're, we are a capitalistic uh, society, but we have 
huge social programs too. Right. So we're a hybrid. I wouldn't say we've gone over to socialism completely, but you know, with the with the with the New Deal, with uh, the rise of uh, social programs, social welfare, you know, a big part of our of our um, non discretionary budget is social spending. Sure it is. Uh, but I think if you but if you that, if you look at that history, help us a little bit. Doesn't that I mean? Yeah, when yeah. You get, when you get not, a polarization yeah. of wealth, which we Obviously, one side promotes that, one side doesn't. But when you get a polarization, it can create, you know. No, I, I agree 100 percent. I think there, you, when you have the money and you can afford to do things to help people, you should. Uh, and and the challenge I think now is we're running, you know, historical and unprecedented debt, which makes me a little nervous. But no, I, I'm saying that to say that we do have a strong social ethic in the United States. And so we're not uh, uh, tribally capitalistic in yeah. some kind of a, in a way that just we're purely profit driven. That's a misnomer. But I think historically, if you look at the rise of what capitalism has done uh, for the last hundred years, it was un untouched. But now we're starting to see real structural advantages because of other structural changes in the world for countries like China. And, and China, post COVID, is now asserting that structurally their model's better. And there are some people that might agree with that, you know, and, and I'm going to talk a little more about China in a minute. Yeah. I don't think there's any um, definitive data because I think the jury's still out. Sure. I, yeah, that's fine. Let's that go. Let's, sense? let's roll to the next part. That's excellent. I don't want to dwell too long on that. I know you've got a lot to talk about. I know which one I prefer and I believe in, but you know, time will tell. Uh, and, and, and I don't think it's just as simple as your, your economic model because all these factors play. Right, so it's also your your form of governance. And it's the it's the balance of power. Yes, it's sir. all the 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 other you know. And I mentioned last week when I was talking to Congressman that Roger Daltrey came out a couple of weeks ago, the lead singer of the Who, mm -hmm. obviously oh, yeah. my generation, all this stuff. And he said, "What are we doing? Socialism doesn't work. We've proved it." Talking about Europe and everything else and, and the push for that. So I think there's a kind of an awakening that capitalism works. You know. Housing values are soaring, right? If you bought I, a neighbor of mine bought a house for one hundred eighty-eight thousand and sold it for three hundred thousand in fourteen, fifteen months. Now he did yeah. do twenty thousand improvements, but I think wealth's being created, social media and other things. There's yeah. so much massive wealth being created electronically and stocks yeah. and stuff that everything's going up. There's a demand. I, I, I see that as a positive. Well, my grandfather had a pretty simple view on it. Doesn't matter what your form of governance is, if you spend more money than you make. Yeah. Then eventually you run out of time, and that's part of it. Yeah. And that and that's the real challenge with whether it's a capitalistic model that has some hybrid social programs or pure socialism. Mm -hmm. If you're destroying more wealth than you're creating, then your form of government won't won't last no matter what it is. So even capitalism can outrun uh, a certain level of spending. Mm -hmm. You can't that's correct. you can't spend actually exponentially more money than you make no matter what your form of government is. And and so I think the. The, the theory today is that uh, we're going to spend, we're going to go $33 trillion in debt, we're going to ramp up our, our uh, deficit spending, and then we're going to mysteriously outgrow it somehow through this burst of economic activity. And we could argue economics and taxes yeah. in the way to solve that problem. Both, I think both political parties in the United States would agree with that. Just yeah. how to solve the problem is, is what to do. Okay, yeah, what's so I'm next? I'm going to try to stay out of the politics. Yeah, what's we'll So we're, we're talking, if you can put up the next slide, slide six. So this is, you know, the other uh, horseman of the apocalypse is economic drivers. And what the research shows is that there's, there's basically three things for uh, civilizations that are faced with these five massive pressures, there's three things you see in the civilizations that don't decline or don't fail when faced with these things. One of them is leadership, okay. and leadership is absolutely critical, and that's undivided leadership. The other is... What do you mean by undivided leadership? Uh, focus, unity, the ability to get things by done. By the leader or by the leadership of the whole country? Both. Okay. Whoever's in charge. I got you. So in our in our system, to it's move a, forward. It's a two party system trying to move it forward. Okay. If you're looking at a uh, seventh century, you know, China, it's a whole different. You know, it's a dictator. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a different uh, layout. But um, 
the main point of this is the, the number two thing, the most important thing, is the economic growth outruns whatever thing is happening, whether it's the epidemic disease, whether it's mass migration, uh, whether it's uh, uh, geopolitical instability. As long as economies can outpace that, then those countries tend to survive and those civilizations tend to survive. And if you look at what's happening to us right now, we're coming out of uh, the 2008 recession, uh, which was a massive recession, which we piled on lots of debt, and this was global. This wasn't a country, this was global recession. Most countries had had a fairly tepid recovery, if recovery at all, fairly flat. And then you had COVID-19 hit with, with massive economic devastation. So when I say that these five things exist today on a global scale in ways they never have before, they, they do. So that's, your, that's your, your migration, your disease, that's your geo, geopolitical instability, and then your economic impact all starting to come together to form really unique pressure um, and historic pressure on the systems that are here. So you look at the UN, uh, you look at NATO, you look at the World Food Organization, you look at the World Health Organization, all these systems are being tested in a way today that they've never been tested in my lifetime. How important is the military and the police? You know, this, this, is a, this is an interesting discussion because I think, you know, we live in a country, one of the only countries on the planet uh, that hasn't seen war on its borders and on its shores in, in most of its life. You know, the last war we had here was the Civil War. Yeah, a big one. And it was a big one. You know, almost 700,000 Americans died. We killed each other. Was there an economic impact to that war? Oh, devastation. Yeah, in I mean, the South, it was. Yeah, I mean, enough. certainly the, the, the uh, Sherman's March to the Sea wiped out yeah. the Southern economic balance completely. So, but yeah, in the world economy, I think we emerged from that with industrialization and... Yeah, there wasn't much of like a true world economy yeah. at that point. That's but, correct. But, but That's the main point way. is most Americans, because we live in, in, a, in a period of growth and unprecedented safety and wealth, never having truly... 9-11 was, was, was a black eye, it bruised our egos, it, was, it hurt our pride, but it wasn't a, a real attack on infrastructure, it wasn't devastating. So people begin to underestimate the importance of the military, but we wouldn't, without the U.S. military, there would be no global economy. The reason that the world's shipping lanes are open is because of the U.S. Navy. And people, this is lost on people. We have global stability. Not just in our country, but worldwide. The whole the US Navy is, is lost on that. Yeah, yeah, you know, so, which is why you see the threats in the South China Sea, which is probably a quarter of the world's trade route for, the, for, uh, for shipping, mm -hmm. is now falling under the control of the Chinese. And so we're, for the first time in, in our lifetime, uh, our, our ability to project power everywhere on the globe has significant challenges. Uh, so w when you couple that kind of economic stuff with now this discussion of climate change, which is the next slide, uh, in all of those periods of history, whether it was drought that led to uh, the decline of the Aztecs or the Incas or those minor kind of climate things, uh, we, we're now dealing, you turn on the TV, it's climate change, climate change, climate change. And there is real evidence that the climate is changing. Now, I don't know, uh, we can, I, I try to stay out of the politics of that. Sure. Um, but I, I think that when you look at all the factors that have led to decline, we're seeing all of those now on a global is scale. Is it man-made causes for these climate changes? It seems to me that, and I'm, and I'm a conservative, but it seems to me that climate change has occurred throughout history. It has, and yeah. it, it evolves, and some things we can't control. I agree. Well, in, 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 in every case, uh, you know, the, whether it was the fall of Rome, climate had a play. And those were regional climate issues, those were regional droughts, those were isolated things that we didn't, we didn't have the ability as, as a race to impact global climate in a significant way. Right. Weren't enough of us on the planet, we weren't generating right. enough of anything to do that. Uh, and, and in the end, frankly, climate change, whether we did it or it's caused by acts of nature, is irrelevant. Is irrelevant. Yeah. The outcome is the same. Yeah. But we have power to change it now. Yeah, and I think we do. And I think you'll see that, you know, in America, um, you know, we're putting out less carbon today than we have in, 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 in many, many years. I mean, we're moving in that direction. You know, and, and the question is, does that change it? You know, I don't know. I would like yeah. to think it would. 
Interesting. But for me, it's it's less a, a political discussion, more of a, just a fact of life that climate has a real impact. It puts when climate changes, it puts immense pressure on global order and the stability of civilizations. And when you combine all five of those things, it's 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 pretty. It's pretty intense. What does the heating of the polar caps have to do with all of this? I mean, it seems to me that that's significant to water and chains and icebergs. And maybe I've watched too many movies on Netflix, <laughs> but uh, that's that's really. I mean, that's not my area of expertise. I, I, you know, I know that as you change the temperature of the ocean, so when you when you melt the the polar ice caps and you push that fresh water, you change the salinity of the ocean, yeah. you change the temperature of the ocean. The ocean is seventy percent of the Earth's surface, that's and good. so. So you have Matt, you have real implications for what's going to happen to the global uh, climate. What's interesting when you look at <coughs> excuse me sci-fi programs and things over years, they've always they've even 50 years ago they had us living in more contained environments in these videos. We weren't running down the street yeah. or we were living in you know shell homes and different things. So I guess so. I guess climate change is a major factor. I think it's interesting. How did climate change? We've got about one minute to break. How did climate change? affect the Middle Ages? <coughs> if it's one of the five deciding factors of civilization. Yeah, so I think really where climate has the biggest impact on agrarian society is the ability oh, yeah. to farm. You know, so you had access to water, uh, droughts, droughts, droughts lead to, to famine, lead to food disease shortages. outbreak, food out shortages lead to, again, it's cascading, right? So a drought can lead to mass migration, it can lead to geopolitical instability, right. so these things begin to feed off of each right. other. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. Thank you for watching Between the Lines. Unlike other health concerns, mental illness is not always easy to see. Third line, please. D E P R E S S I O N. Mental illness doesn't show up on a scale. Bipolar? Hmm. Sorting out a mental health concern is not something to attempt on your own. Hmm. Anxiety. I thought so. Like many health conditions, help for mental illness takes professional diagnosis and treatment. And the sooner you seek treatment, the better. Look at that. 6,000 steps and PTSD. If you or a loved one has a mental health concern, don't go it alone. Find out what to do. For 24-hour free and confidential information and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Learn more at SAMHSA.gov support. ready, always there. Visit NationalGuard.com to find out more. Hello, I'm District Attorney General Dave Clark. My fellow DAs and I successfully fought for new elder abuse laws and procedures that have police departments and agencies using improved tools to protect our seniors. Victims of elder abuse are often unable to recognize or report abuse themselves. They need your voice. If you suspect abuse, contact local law enforcement or adult protective services. Let's work together to protect our seniors. What if one day you went to that secret place, that spot that only you know about, and instead of what you came for, you found this? What would you do? Would you stop and give us some thought? The truth is, all drug use comes with risk. Before those risks become real, before drugs turn your life upside down. Before drugs take their toll on you and your family. Know that there is help. You can quit. If you or someone you love is struggling with drug use or prescription drug misuse, call 1-800-662-HELP for 24-hour free and confidential information and treatment referral or go to samhsa.gov slash know the risks. 
Between the Lines would like to thank Protection Strategies Incorporated for sponsoring tonight's program. One of our country's leading providers of integrated security services, including operational security, training, testing, and evaluation. Clients of PSI include the Department of Justice, the FBI, and the Department of Energy. Brian Spitzer, for Circuit Court Judge, is also sponsoring tonight's program. Brian is a prosecutor and Army medic for six years and a lifetime Tennessean. A graduate of Vanderbilt Law School, Brian is dedicated to serving the citizens of Anderson County. Welcome back to Between the Lines. I want to take a minute to thank Sessions Judge Roger Miller for sponsoring our program. Uh, he's helping and we appreciate it. And we're going to get back to... Um, we're going to get back to discussion. We're going to move it away from the macro theories, and we're going to get into where is China, where is Japan, you know, where are these companies, Russia, and how do they fit into the United States and our security and our future. Okay. What do we need to look at? Well, I, I think if you look at the, you know, we talk about the five horsemen of, of the apocalypse. Those are Dr. Ian Morris's words. But the, the point of that is to show you that there's, his, there's historic global pressure right now. Mm -hmm. And it's also taking place at a time where we're seeing a real shift in global power, too. So for the first time in our lifetime, um, the United States role of supremacy in the number one position is being challenged by another country. Across the board or in certain areas? I, well, I most would argue across the board. We're talking about China, right? Talking about China, yeah, yeah, and, sure. and and I would say uh, certainly economically across the board. Uh, and and if you look at structurally what they're putting in place for their through their Belt and Road Initiative, their engagement with over 70 countries on that. You look at the, you know, I'll give you one example. We we produce about 50,000 engineers a year. They produce about 500,000 engineers a year. You know, so on scale, uh, they are they are challenging us. That's in, in a, in a historic level. Um, and it's not just there. I mean, you, you've got the, the rise of dictatorships, uh, the rise of autocracies. Uh, you've got uh, nuclear powers emerging in places we never imagined, like uh, North, North Korea and Iran. You've got the, the, the EU being challenged, you know, that experiment, the EU uh, being challenged with Brexit, you know, the first major member to leave in, in the history of that country. Uh, so I, I would say that there is a, a major uh, global global contest underway for the balance of power. And, and what's the prize? Okay, I'm number one. What does that matter? Well, I mean, you're, you're getting to the heart of the human condition. I mean, I mean that's just, uh, you know, why does anybody want power? But at the end, it's, it's domination leads to wealth, leads to uh, uh, influence, leads to all of the above. And, and everybody's got, I mean, who knows, everybody's got a different reason for well, that. Well, the communist ideology that propels China, at least to a large part, the ultimate goal, you know, that kind of power in the sense of domination and other things, um, is wealth being created? Are there, are there individuals and families and people in China that are living, you know, at, the, at a multi-million dollar lifestyle? Yeah, so so you you know you've got the uh, you've got the red royalty in China, which is uh, the, the the Communist Party loyals and the members of the Communist Party, and and that tends to be where the highest concentration of wealth is. You, you had an experimentation that Xi Jinping's really began to wind down in in allowing for some capitalistic models within their society. So uh, the the rise of Alibaba. How old is Ping now? Seventies. Xi Jinping, I'm not sure. Probably I 60s. I okay. couldn't tell you. I don't know for sure his age. Uh, but the 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 rise of like Alibaba, which is our Amazon, uh, the the capitalistic growth that you saw. There's a lot of distrust for that. So there was real personal wealth generated in China uh, and billionaires created through that. But uh, there's a real distrust for that now in the Communist Party. And he's starting to lock a lot of that down and jail some of these people and, and put restraints on these people. Uh, but China has a huge poverty issue. Uh, and, oh, that's and, and when you look at China uh, with a billion plus people on scale, they're far, they have massive poverty challenges. Uh, so, so I think it's, uh, again, so we're the talking, size of the we're economy, be, to be effective, they have a billion, we have 300 million, rough, roughly. Yeah, yeah, numbers. exactly. So they've got to produce three and a half times or three and a third times the amount of food, the amount of everything for their economy to be 
as successful as ours. Is that, is that a Well, I think the draw there is that when you look at open markets and when you look at emerging markets where you have consumers, so I, I think the, the West is allured to this idea that China is going to become a consumer society like America. Mm -hmm. And American consumerism drives a large portion of the global economy, sure. including China's. You know, so people desperately want into that market because they, you know, you get into the American market, you've got a couple hundred million potential consumers. Mm -hmm. You go into the Chinese market and you might have six or seven hundred million potential consumers. So I think that's the attraction. But it also puts immense pressure on a social welfare state because uh, structurally China's got real challenges emerging with aging population. Uh, they, they, you know, because of their one child rule for years and years that they've lifted, they don't have uh, a yeah. real demographic of youthful people coming into the back yeah. end of that. So, so time will tell on yeah. where China goes. Okay, what's our next, what's our... All right, so let's, uh, if you can go to slide 10 real quick. Sounds like he's. Sounds like he. Yeah. So China's a, you know, they're they're starting to take lead in, in significant ways um, post COVID. And the interesting thing is, is they're really claiming victory at this point. If you look at all of their, if you look at all of their rhetoric that's coming out, they say that because of their ability to control COVID, because of their ability to control their social narrative, because of their ability to structurally invest in growth and in technology. Um, they are. They have the superior model, and they're now talking about exporting it. Tell me, explain to our viewers China's Belt and Road Initiative. What is this program about? In, in, in a minute. Yeah. So the the Belt and Road Initiative is, is a hugely ambitious project project where they are investing in other countries to complete really to, to complete a trade route. And there's two major trade routes that they're investing in. But this is developing ports. This is developing rail and developing uh, uh, transit and developing the ability to ship goods and services. And it's a two-way Does street. anybody else have that vision? Anybody else have that kind of visionary experience? I mean, so this is, this is where you get into the, the kind of structural discussion between which model is superior, right? In the United States, in a capitalistic model, uh, that investment's driven by return on investment, which uh, capitalism doesn't always align with state goals goals, mm -hmm. doesn't always align with uh, the political goals of a country, it aligns with the goals of the investors. Mm -hmm. And what China is able to do is go into a country that might be a risky investment to build a strategic advantage by going in and, and building a port or building a rail, uh, rail into it and building, spending their money, state money, to invest in infrastructure that gives them trade routes and relationships with these countries probably for the next 100 years. Now, is it going to work? Hard to say. Early evidence is that it, it is working uh, fairly well, but only time's going to tell. So when you say trade routes, we're thinking about, you know, we're thinking about uh, ships coming to America and water trade routes and different ports and things. I, I have a kind of a renaissance mind for that and since I don't think of it in modern terms when you're talking about ports are you talking about an expansion yes yeah, so they're physical they're, stuff or they're are talking, talking about, about physical investment they're going in they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars around the globe to build um, uh, how ports. does it create a roadway well it creates avenues for for goods and trade into places that didn't previously and that includes exist. digital investment it's digital investment, but we're talking real infrastructure. We're talking highways, railways, and in places massive. they control. Well, they own it, you know. And 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 can China come into the United States and build? Or they'll loan you the money. Uh, they'll build it they for you, that, they'll, or they'll build it for you, and then you have to you know pay them back over time. So it puts it put, it embeds them into the economies and into the politics of all these 68 countries that they're starting to expand in. We're 20 trillion, 30 trillion, between 20 and 30 trillion dollars in debt. What's their situation? Do they have debt? Well, they have debt. Yeah, they've yeah. they've they've seen debt, not on the not on the scale that we have it yet, but they've got debt, and and they've got real they've got infrastructure challenges. I mean, it, so this again, like I said, these aren't decided points. These are just facts. We are being challenged in ways, but when you asked is is communism or capitalism structurally better? Uh, the, historically, the proof has been in capitalism works the best because that incentivizes individuals. Mm -hmm. We will find out over time whether the Belt and Road Initiative works, whether the uh, direct a state sponsorship of economic growth and state ownership in the way that China is doing it is going to succeed or not. Now, at this point, it succeeded to the point where they are the first in, in our lifetime to challenge us economically in any material way. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. 
Yeah, so, so you Let's know, the not other, forget the Middle East for we Well, the, the, the other thing I'll, I'll say about that is you've got two things that have emerged. You know, for the first time, the, the challenges aren't just economic. Uh, if you look at what China's done in the South China Sea, it's going to be really very hard for the first time in, in modern history for the U.S. to project power there. And questionable whether or not without really massive cost can we even protect Taiwan from a Chinese invasion. And you go look at what Russia's done with the deployment of tactical nuclear weapons in the Baltic states, not in the states, but on that line. Uh, it's going to be pretty difficult for us to go in there without really significant costs and protect our, our NATO allies as well. And so there are, there are real military regional challenges emerging. Uh, so I, I, at this point, China's not in a position to challenge us globally. Um, other than Russia's nuclear arsenal, they're not in a position to challenge us globally. But regionally, they can, they can have some pretty strong dominance. Interesting. We're going to take one more break, and then we're going to come back and talk about cybersecurity and uh, who's looking at you on your computer. Um, <laughs> two minutes, and we'll be right back. Hello, I'm District Attorney General Dave Clark. My fellow DAs and I successfully fought for new elder abuse laws and procedures that have police departments and agencies using improved tools to protect our seniors. Victims of elder abuse are often unable to recognize or report abuse themselves. They need your voice. If you suspect abuse, contact local law enforcement or adult protective services. Let's work together to protect our seniors. Always ready, always there. Visit NationalGuard.com to find out more. Since the moment you were born, I've made a thousand wishes. Wishes for your future in a world that's changing fast. Do play and laugh. Do win and lose. Do it all with confidence, kindness, and strength. And always do your best to remember that no matter what you do in this life, what matters to me, is that you keep doing. I'm Andrew Saul, Commissioner of Social Security. Beware of telephone scammers pretending to be government employees. Real Social Security employees will never threaten you. Call is threatening you with arrest or other legal action and demanding money are not from us. If you receive a call like this, hang up, do not provide them with any form of payment or information. Report the call at oig.ssa.gov. Between the Lines would like to thank Protection Strategies Incorporated for sponsoring tonight's program. One of our country's leading providers of integrated security services, including operational security, training, testing, and evaluation. Clients of PSI include the Department of Justice, the FBI, and the Department of Energy. Brian Spitzer, for Circuit Court Judge, is also sponsoring tonight's program. Brian is a prosecutor and Army medic for six years and a lifetime Tennessean. A graduate of Vanderbilt Law School, Brian is dedicated to serving the citizens of Anderson County. Welcome back to Between the Lines. When you run a mile run, when we were kids, you run four laps around the track. We're starting lap four right now. <laughs> we're ready to go, Sean. Let's, let's bring it home. Put so, me through the ringer. Yeah, you go. So uh, the point of those things really is just to talk about historical pressure sure. and these things that are kind of converging uh, as we're starting to see a shift in global, really a challenge to the balance of power globally. Mm -hmm. and, and there's no guarantee on outcomes. There's no guarantee that America wins. You know, the decisions sure. we make, uh, the, the things that we're doing in this valley, the things we're doing here in Oak Ridge actually have a massive impact on sure. this game. And this is the oldest game. This is the Game of Thrones. This is the oldest game known sure. to humanity that we're engaged in. So I want to talk about a couple of inflection points, because if you look at all throughout history, uh, there have been inflection points uh, where uh, technology and, and tradecraft have changed the balance of power. Sure. So the invention of the spear. 
the crossbow. The, the sure. crossbow. Uh, go to the 1300s. Uh, the the advent of the longbow for sure. England. Uh, the the Bronze Age, and you know the first time Egypt faced an invading army that had bronze armor and bronze weapons and and advanced uh, superiority in, on the sure. battlefield with those things. And so we've got a couple of major inflection points happening right now that will have a direct impact on the balance of global power going forward. So if we can get slide 12. The first one is is AI, and uh, you know this isn't again Sean Williams' opinion. This is the Brookings Institute. These are some of the best think tanks in the world. Uh, but right now we're clearly in an arms race for artificial intelligence. Uh, and uh, the Brookings Institute came out last year and said whoever gets artificial intelligence first is going to rule the planet for the next hundred years. And so we are neck deep in this race for AI and countries like China and Russia are investing heavily. In some cases China is investing more in a, than we are in their artificial intelligence programs. Uh, but if you look at what's happening right here at Oak Ridge National Labs, we have the fastest computer in the world. Uh, trying to solve the artificial intelligence problem, among other things. You got the third fastest computer in the world. Now they're looking to teach it to teach the fastest computer to get into what we hope is a, is a, is a true self thinking entity at some point. Is that dangerous to humanity? Uh, I, you know, I think that uh, there's a lot of scientists that think it is. You know, I don't know. Uh, Bill Gates and, and Stephen Hawking and, and some of the brightest minds of our, our, our generation. Uh, penned a letter a couple of years ago, and it, last time I looked, it had over 100,000 signatures on it, I believe, warning us about the dangers of artificial intelligence and to slow down. They weren't saying that it's, you know, it's like anything that we, that, that humanity gets, that we create, and it's human nature. You know, it's all the way back to the Old Testament. Um, anything we create for good will be used for bad. That's just the nature of things. Sure. Uh, the, the fear I think they have is for the first time we're moving into something we don't fully understand, That's right. which could potentially have a superior intelligence to our own and could yeah, be a real says, threat. We don't yeah. need you anymore. I can't see a logical reason for you to exist. Bang, you're dead. Yeah, it goes back to all the science fiction movies, yeah. right? Yeah, it turns out right. humanity is really the problem. But it makes but, sense. But I, you know, I, think there's, I think there's more, you know, for me, more pragmatic concerns. You know, if you look at, um, if you look at the, the, the fact that if I have advanced AI uh, hacking capability, there's no human response to that. Humans can't outthink AI, and so a country that gets that level of superiority is going to have full run. That's the, the theory. And if you look at the United States, our dependence on electricity, our infrastructure, you know, we, we could not have built our infrastructure to be more vulnerable had we tried, because we built it in this historic run of peace and prosperity. We didn't imagine being attacked on our own soil. And now we're being attacked literally uh, hundreds of thousands of times a day. Uh, mm -hmm. through through uh, the cyber threat on our infrastructure. If you can put the next slide up, um, and, and when you talked about the, the scale and the intensity of things, if, if you're paying attention to what's happening in, in the, with the cyber threat, the, the, the pace and the effectiveness and the scale of the outcomes are only increasing. You know, so a few years ago when they got in the OMB and they took all our security clearance data, I was pretty surprised by that. You know, I have a TS and a Q clearance, and I would tell you the Chinese know more about me than I fam my family does because they've got my, my security clearance, and we were sure. pretty upset about that. Now we just had the solar winds attack. The solar winds attack, which is yeah. kind of blew up in the media and then went away. Department of Energy. 18,000 companies got hacked. Yeah. And, and the nature of that attack is you, we don't know where they went, we don't know what they took, and we can't prove they're not still there. And that's just the 18,000 companies they got into, um, which includes companies like Microsoft mm -hmm. uh, and Apple. And you think about all the data and the access to your life that you have in your Microsoft office systems. But then it was also a myriad of government agencies, and there's a lot of government agencies that aren't telling about what actually happened to them sure. because it's strategically not okay. Uh, and then you start to see real attacks on, on infrastructure like the, the Colonial Pipeline. Yeah. And, and thankfully that was a, uh, a criminal activity. It wasn't a state-sponsored right. event. But the truth is, is if it's got industrial control software and it can be accessed, then there's probably somebody that can get to it. And when you look at that, the, the vulnerabilities of that it creates, it's pretty massive. In a country like America, where we're, we're probably more dependent on electricity than any other country in the world. Uh, Why is that? Why would a big country not be dependent on electricity? Well, you look at, you look at um, 
because of how much we drive? Well, it's because of the massive infrastructure we've been able to build, uh, the build and how cheap electricity is in this country compared to other countries. But 100% of our systems are relying on it, whether that's our, our, our fuel, our oil, our water, our sewage. Um, when Hurricane Sandy hit, uh, that affected about 20 states. Mm -hmm. And I mean, little things you wouldn't think about. The power was off for about 14 days in some of those states. They were stacking bodies up behind the morgue because you can't light the incinerators when the safety switch goes off because there's no power to the pilot light. Uh, and the freezers weren't working. Uh, when when the, we had the ice storm here a couple of years ago in Middle Tennessee, uh, people would get down to Kroger. Kroger actually got some generators, but you couldn't buy anything because the cash machines were down. So if you didn't have cash, you couldn't buy anything. Uh, you, you know, I spent time as a contractor in Iraq in 2012, 2011. A lot of these countries, we, we take for granted that the rest of the world is like us. It isn't. Uh, we, you know, 99.8% of the homes in America have hot and cold running water, have central heating and air conditioning, have cable television. That makes us unique globally. And so we have a dependence uh, that many, many other countries don't have uh, at a level we don't have. Are we getting soft? Well, it depends. <laughs> no. I mean, we, you know, it's, it's like I always argue that the person on dependence and there are a lot of people that really need it i see it every day at the stores and the food banks that i help but a lot of people have a better lifestyle not working in this country as we've always talked about sure. than some people that are working hard in other countries and other places so motivation well we're 100 percent, especially in urban society we're 100 100 percent reliant on the infrastructure we are no longer uh, resilient and self-reliant so if that's soft, I guess we have become okay. soft. I don't want to interrupt you. No, no, no. I think I think it's a fair point though, because you know you look at the grocery store here; it's got about a three-day food supply in it. And what people don't see over here at Kroger is that there are trucks 24 hours a day pulling into the back and shoving food in the back. So it's like this. Or toilet paper. Or toilet paper. The rush on toilet paper. <laughs> so it's like this that. magic supply, but yeah. the second that gets interrupted, and you know, if you'd have gone into my grandmother's pantry, she had a full walk-in pantry. She had she used to can her own food. Food, months and she had food from the floor to the ceiling now she survived the Great Depression she she survived uh, two major world wars the Korean War the sure. Vietnam My War uh, eight economic downturns you could have shut the lights off tomorrow and gone to my grandmother's house and lived for six months comfortably sure. We don't do that anymore. In fact, most modern homes don't even have a pantry in them anymore. That's right. Yeah, so. We do. My son will be fine as long as Chick-fil-A does not go down. <laughs> you could just get some power to Chick-fil-A. All right, go on. Waffle fries, man. Waffle they're, they're fries. The there you go. We're, chick we're, many, we're chicken many people. So that's cyber threat, and that's very real, and that's escalating, and that's going nowhere. It's going to continue, and, and it's going to grow. Uh, and you introduce AI into that, and that, that adds a whole new level of complexity. The other thing we're seeing is, is uh, the militarization of space. So the race to, to put the military in space is on. China's investing heavily. Russia's investing heavily. Um, and, and so there, there is a, an inflection point there where superiority in space gives real advantage and could be a tipping point in the power balance as we go forward. And again, the economy is important of all of this because it drives the investment. Uh, many would say that, that, that America won the Cold War because Reagan was willing to out invest That's the Russians, exactly what happened. Right? And so militarization of space is alive and well. And if you look here in the valley, uh, U.S. Space Command coming to Huntsville. You know, what's interesting is the Tennessee Valley Corridor geographically is engaged in every one of these conversations in on a global level and, and on a very important level. our viewers, the Tennessee Valley Corridor is all of the technology that runs from the southern, the Virginia-Tennessee border all the way down into Alabama into the rocket science and everything, highlighted by a lot of East Tennessee in here. And Sean serves on that board. And okay. you, are you are you the president right now? Or no. Were you, you were something, <laughs> chairman or something? No, I'm a, a political appointee, and I'm also on the leadership council. Leadership the council, Tennessee okay, Valley great. So... They do a wonderful job. Um, go ahead. I'm so two, two more things. Um, again, another inflection point. That, two and a half minutes. That'll, uh, if you can put the next, go back one slide. We're missing, we're slide 15. Do I got We'll talk about it. Go ahead. 
Okay, well, I was going to talk about uh, nuclear proliferation. So we're, we're also facing a new age of nuclear proliferation. We don't talk about it much here in this country, but uh, 2019, Global Power spent about $75 billion uh, enhancing worldwide. worldwide, and we're a big chunk of that. There's the slide. Uh, what I'll say about this is we've got more countries today and growing that had that have nuclear power than at, at the time of the Cold War. When we won the Cold War, we kind of just raised our hands in victory and moved on. In 1996, we disbanded our civil defense program. So I remember, I remember as a kid, duck and cover. You yeah. remember the videos at school? My elementary school. You remember seeing the nuclear Cyrus fallout something. shelters? We were, as a country, preparing to survive nuclear war. Sure. We're one of the few uh, nuclear powers that no longer does that. We disbanded our civil defense program. And I, and I can't tell you the last time I saw a nuclear fallout shelter sign. But you look at Russia, you look at China. They're, Especially Russia. Well, they're investing heavily in their nuclear weapons programs, and they're also investing heavily in civil defense planning and in nuclear shelters. You go to Switzerland or Sweden, many of those countries, you can't build a new building unless you've got a nuclear fallout shelter in it. So at a time where we're proliferating and the arms race is on and there's evidence that we're at the beginning edge of a nuclear arms race in the Middle East, uh, America's not really prepared for that. And then the last one's just the emerging technology that he put yeah, that's there. Yeah, the, the emerging technology slide, huh? And, um, and we had that on there. Yes. And that's you know all the things we've talked about, and, sure. and and that's happening here in the valley. And then one thing in closing, I think the greatest threat we face is division in our country. Yeah. And our our enemies are investing heavily to divide us through social media, uh, whether it's on race, whether it's on on arms control or any of those things. Yeah. So a divided America, I think, is our single greatest threat to national security. We saw that last year. We saw foreign investment into Facebooks and everything to disrupt people on both sides. It's a political issue. Yeah. We're lucky to have someone like you to come on our show. We really appreciate well, it, Sean, and thank you for sponsoring. And these are important issues. We're going to keep week after week looking into them and reading between the lines. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate your time. No.